and gentlemen, like neurons in our brains, our business processes are connected by a software, enabling a hassle-free way to run our entire businesses. Zoho presents you with a unique and powerful, uh, unique and powerful suite of software to transform the way you work. Connect with them at the Business Experience Center. Ladies and gentlemen, we move on to the next bit of our program this afternoon. And today, we have with us Mr. Rajendra Dandapani, who is a Contra Academician at heart. Feeling strongly that the education system in India needs a reboot, he has also walked the talk, doing his own small bit by free schooling his son at home. His son is now his colleague at Zoho Corp. Rajendran was a part of the founding team of Zoho Corporation, then called Vembo Systems. He spearheads mobile development at Zoho with a large team of creative designers and developers that build mobile apps for Zoho's 45 million plus users. He is also the dean at Zoho University, Zoho's own ongoing social experiment, seen by many as a viable alternative to controversial to conventional college education. Today, he is here to talk to us about pitfalls when developing a SAAS product. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming on stage Mr. Rajendra Dandapani. Afternoon. SAAS is pronounced SAS for software as a service. 20, 30 products that we saw today, services and companies, some talked about hardware, some talked about algorithms, some talked about real people working in a collaborative manner, getting work done. But under all that, there was some software. Software is eating the world, they say. We saw that with Uber, we saw that with Ola, we saw that with Amazon, we saw that with Flipkart. So when you build a product, when you build a SaaS-based product, what are some things to probably keep in mind? What are some things to probably avoid is what I'm going to talk about today. Let's start with a question. What's the length of the Indian coastline? It's a trick question, actually. Because when you look at it from the space, for spacecraft, from a Google Maps view, you would think that the answer is 7,500 kilometers, perhaps. But what if you change the perspective? That's actually the Chennai Harbor. Chennai is the place that I come from. From an aeroplane point of view, what do you think the number is? Because now you get to see the harbor's inroads, right? What about a bird's point of view? Now you actually get to see small twists and turns along the coastline. Get even lower. What about a walking person's point of view? Right? Every little twist and turn on the sand will now be measured and the length will keep increasing. An ant, every sand hill is a mountain and hence the measurement explodes. The question I want to ask you is, if it's a 100 kilometer rod that I'm measuring it with, 7,500 kilometers was the coastline. And if it was a 50 kilometer rod, it immediately jumped to 45,000 kilometers. My question is, does it converge? It depends on the length of the rod, but as it gets smaller, the coastline got longer, does it converge to some number? If you keep making the rod smaller, it doesn't. The answer could be arbitrarily large. This comes from a science concept in physics called fractals. British Columbia is famous for these two locations, Vancouver Island and Alaskan Panhandle. That distance is just 600 miles. But if you actually go through every nook and corner and walk that path, it's 15,000 miles because that's how it looks deep down there. That's the science of fractals self-similarity across dimensions, infinite resolution as you keep zooming in. That was the point. But what does fractals have to do with software and software as a service? 
Because I look at the business landscape as a jigsaw puzzle. And it's not just a normal, common jigsaw puzzle. It's actually a fractal jigsaw puzzle. Because if you just take Zoho itself as a product suite, we thought that's the Zoho suite, and these are the important products that make it up. But only when we started going deeper and deeper into Zoho CRM, for example, we found that there were things to do within that. There could be leads, there could be opportunities, projects, contacts, workflows. And we just pick one of them and we dig deeper, you see that it splits too into multiple aspects. Each one of them can actually be a startup pitch today. Just focusing on nurturing leads, just focusing on lead management. And I didn't even mention the so many other suites that actually make up the day-to-day -day needs of any business organization. So take, the look at, take a look at the selfie, the famous photograph where the face is extremely zoomed in, which was brought onto Earth simply because we had smartphones, but we didn't have long hands. Right? So this was the selfie. The selfie stick was invented because people wanted to take neater photographs. Somewhere else in the world, another revolution was happening. There was the invention of the drone, the quadcopter that could actually be manipulated remotely. But here was this guy who came up with a selfie drone. Right? Putting these two things in a meaningful, interesting, out-of-the-box way, and coming up with an overlapping product. So the lesson I am trying to convey here is the business landscape is a fractal jigsaw puzzle. And if you think it's mature, I don't want to get into this business because it's mature. There are so many competitors. I don't think what I can do anymore, dig deeper, change the rod. And it's infinitely interesting. What we thought was a module could actually be a product, could actually be a suite of products and could actually define a new domain in itself. So that's the first lesson I want to convey to you. Don't think it's all out there. What can I get started with? Just get in and innovate and improvise along the way. Zoho is nothing but its people, 7,000 strong. So when I was told that I will be asked to talk about pitfalls to avoid when thinking about a SaaS product, I just went to my people. I asked my top managers, hey folks, I need this for a talk tomorrow. What would you say from your experience, from your perspective? What are the pitfalls to avoid when building a SaaS product? I touched upon designers, usability experts, marketing gurus, suite heads, country heads, marketers, the whole gang. I even called our vice president, the one comes from the corner there. He's our vice president at Zoho. I got them all together and I asked them that question. I received more than I could have asked for. But the more interesting aspect of the answers I received was they were actually contradictory. Somebody was saying, go global. Somebody else was saying, start local. Somebody was saying, don't plan for scalability. Somebody else was saying, you have to put your foundation strong, get the data design done early. But then I realized every product, based on its maturity, based on its target audience, the game is different. So most important disclaimer, I'm going to talk to you about 18 lessons today. Most important lesson though is, your mileage might vary. This works for us. This is hard found wisdom, 22 years of it, taken directly from these people, brought out, I am just the messenger. But your mileage might vary, beware. Let's get started. The first thing about a SaaS product is uptime or availability. People just expect you to be available. In fact, 99.9 .9 no longer cuts it. It's five nines. You have to be available all the time. 
So how do you plan for availability? Assume you're building a product like Zoho Mail, one of my favorite products. Of course, there will be a downtime. There might be a server down. There might be a bug that brings uh, your uh, product to its knees. There might be too much traffic. There might be a DDoS attack. How are you going to plan for uptime? One solution the Zoho Mail team has come up with is we have a backup server which has a mirror of all the data that we have on the main server. But not just there, we also have a read-only mode in a third server. So even if the first two services that host Zoho Mail for you goes down, you will at least have access to every mail that has been sent and received in the past in read-only mode, which is perhaps a very good uh, savior for you in times of emergency. So planning for availability is very important. The second thing you need to keep in mind is if you build too good a product, people are going to come flocking. The App Store and the Play Store don't have that problem because they are taken care of by Google and Apple. And all you need to do is build a good app and let Apple scale it for you. That's not the case when you run your own software as a service. And you have to be careful what you wish for. If you wish for 45 million users, like Zoho's collection of users, to come marching to your doorstep, you need to have a solution. You need to be the Pied Piper. And so scalability is to be planned very early in the game. In fact, one of the scaling challenges we faced early in the life of Zoho was the difference between impossible, one user cannot access another user's data. Impossible, it's simply not possible, versus it is possible only in rare conditions where the Tomcat service itself goes into a, a, a panic mode, or you have access to this database's password and the second authentication of that database. There's a difference between impossible and possible only if. Do not plan for possible only if. Plan for impossible. Sharding the data, preserving it across servers, isolating user's data, because that's probably the most sacred thing you will lay your hands on as a SaaS service manager. So planning for that is very important. Security, every other day we hear news about some other data leak. You don't know whether you should even go to this hotel again. You don't know whether you should close your Facebook account or your Google account. We keep hearing this. And this can make or break because credibility deeply tied with trust, deeply tied with the last position that your data has in this cloud, in the shared cloud of the company you have given all your data to. So planning for security is extremely important. Do not push it forward and say, I will handle it when I apply for GDPR compliance. I will handle it when I really go global or when I really register my company and become accountable for the data I am collecting. You are accountable for the data you are collecting from the day your service goes online. Only when you deeply ingrain it into the DNA of that last intern that you recruited yesterday, will your data be safe? Will you be able to project yourself as a secure stronghold company? That's important. We all remember this scene. This is where the girl and the boy in Titanic rose stood, and now it's down under the sea. One of the most important reasons this tragedy happened was they didn't bother too much about defect isolation. So there's a term for it. They call it failure isolation. Of course, you have to. It's not a question of if my service is broken into. It's always a question of when. In fact, I thought when somebody asked me, when somebody was telling me there are only two kinds of companies in the world with respect to security. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know those that have been hacked and those that haven't yet been. I thought I was being smart. 
But you know what's the real answer? There are only two kinds of companies in the world. Those that have been hacked and those that don't know they have been hacked yet. That's the difference. All data, if it is important, has already passed hands. So at least try to do failure isolation. If there is a leak, it won't get the whole house flooded out through the leak. It will just be limited to that one room. And then you can activate your uh, security safeguard measures and probably do some damage control. Record everything. Once upon a time, when I, when I was an active programmer, I used to push commenting about my code to the last. And then I used to do lip service. I used to pay lip service for activating logs and actually telling the world or telling my um, uh, quality analysts and documentation experts about what data was transferred, what was coming in, what was going out. And then I learned it's different. Writing a program is different from writing software. When you talk about writing software as a service, you need to audit everything. And to be able to audit everything, you need to have a running commentary of what's happening. Never do all this in the user's thread. Don't make the user wait and say, let me note down all the things that you have told me. No. But ensure that there is a parallel thread that takes care of the simultaneous logging. Because you never know when that's going to be useful. And you know when that's going to be useful? That brings us to the next point, which is artificial intelligence. You will always have to plan for AI. There is so much gold out there to be dug up. Stuff we don't know. Humans cannot really pick out that insight. Things that will pop up. Things, trends that will get analyzed. But the most important need for AI to come onto your platform, there are two needs. There's going to be a need for a very good algorithm. But to feed that algorithm, you need big data. Don't say, I'll wait for a million users. A single user, if tracked properly, can actually give you a million data points. Do not lose access to that gold. And don't misuse it, of course. This is just for using it, not for selling ads, targeted ads, but for mining the data and being a better solution for the customer who has come asking you for help. When planning a product, don't plan it like this. I'll first build a wheel, which is useless. Two wheels connected by a rod, which is again useless. And then finally, there's a body that comes on, which I can't sit on, and finally the car is out. Don't keep the customer waiting for your product. He or she wants to evaluate that product like that. People who were doing these pitches today, we wanted them to come off stage and we wanted to try those products. That's how impatient we are. Instead, build it like this. At every step of the way, it is a mobile platform. Yes, it gets better, but our customers learn to trust us, learn to expect something from us. Get out to the customer and learn to iterate with your customer. Co-opt them. Get them into the loop and play along with them. So talking about uh, listening to your customers, there's a time when listening might not go well, but here is an example. There used to be this company called Bourbon. I'm not sure if you have even heard of this service. You could do check-ins to locations. You could make plans for future check-ins. It's even better than Foursquare or Swarm then. You can earn points for hanging out with friends. You can share photos and many, many more features. But the only feature that started the customers talking about it was sharing photos. Do you know what happened? Do you know what Bourbon became later? Instagram. Instagram was born because pivotability was in the DNA of the founder. The person was able to see, I launched my product with 15 features. But there is this one goddamn idiotic feature that I launched that my users seem to fall in love with. They pivoted. Same case. There was glitch. 
It was a browser-based, three-dimensional world you could play using Flash. Nobody wanted to play it, though. It had an amazing chatbot. You could talk with other users who were playing the game. What do you think this pivoted to? Became Slack, you're right. So because the chatbot was the one that really gave them traction, and the customers were actually being listened to, it really became the runaway hit that Slack is today. And talking about listening to customers, remember that we also have to be careful not to get carried away by that. Southwest Airlines used to get repeated calls and emails from one lady who always kept complaining that there was no legroom, the coffee served was chill, the window was not aligned properly to her seat, all the hundred things that all people have come to accept today with respect to airlines, she couldn't. One day, this customer service agent escal escalated it to the CEO, and that's what he said. Dear Mr. Crabapple, we'll miss you, love. Please, be ready to let customers go. Do not try to be the greatest solution for every one of your customers. You're not going to be able to do that. Don't be afraid to tell your Mrs. Crabapple that you will miss her. She may not always be right. Careful about this, the urge to go vernacular. The government will probably give you a lot of money, subsidize if you have it in Hindi. Or there might be this undiscovered territory in Africa. If only you can run it in uh, Spanish or uh, French, you will be able to get into that area. Be careful. Because most of the times, when you do a vernacular version of your product at a later time, when you build your product in English, and try vernacularizing it at a later time or internationalizing it at a later time, it ends up being lip service. It's just become the icing on the cake. It doesn't become the cake itself. So you'll have to be a little careful. Go dire se, go slow. Yes, it's important. There is a large percentage of humanity which doesn't speak English, which might want your product. But do it right. Don't let that be a hastily tacked on add-on at the end. And along with being um, uh, vernacular or being international in your language, you also have to be careful going global. Because that is the low-hanging fruit of SaaS. When you are building a SaaS product, you can proudly say, all you need is a web browser. Wherever you are in the world, you can access our product. But most of the times, the product, the people we work with, the, the, the stuff that we use, the service that we use, has atoms attached to it. There is a physicality to the end product. So you may not be able to serve as well as you can serve Koramangala, you may not be able to serve Trichy or Kanyakumari. So be very careful when you phase out and start going global. Have a rolled out prop a proper phased out policy so that you can slowly, and there is another problem also to it when you're talking about going global. I'll come to that later. Do not embrace and obsess about process too much. If this is what your process looks like for getting an approval done or a quality control done, probably you're overdoing it, right? So take it easy, simplify your process. Do not have more than probably three levels of anything. Three levels to the CEO, three levels to the end customer, three ways to access the database. Let that be simple. So yes, process is important. Repeatability is important, but do not overdo it. There is this book I'm reading by Katie Sierra, and it talks about a map like this, a graph across time and product usage. Be careful about Letting your, pro letting your users getting stuck in between the suck threshold and the badass threshold. What is the suck threshold? The suck threshold is like your grandpa trying to use a smartphone. He doesn't even know how to type because his fingers are thick, arthritic, slow. It's, he, he says, hey, can you call my son and gives you the phone? That's the suck threshold. What's the badass threshold? People who shoot amazing videos 
and at the end they say shot on an iPhone. Only then you realize, oh my God, all the effects, all the great visuals were from an iPhone. That's the difference. But unfortunately, almost 99% of the people here in this room, including myself, are caught between the suck threshold and the badass threshold. And as a product builder, you have to be careful not to let your users move forward in time, but not in up in ability. Because if they are not going to get better in their ability, you won't be able to sell the next version of your product. They're going to say, hey, all that I needed from your service, I already have in the free version itself. Why do I need to actually pay you the extra money? So you need to encourage them to move towards the badass threshold. Because that's when they realize superpowers. That's when they realize they can be talked about. Hey, did you see the video he posted? Isn't it super cool? I wish I could do a video like that. You need to get your users to get talked about. It's not enough if your users talk about your product. Your users should get talked about. That's the message from that book. Don't give them prefabricated, ready-made, unchangeable, end-of-life solutions. Instead, give them pieces to play with. Because they are going to surprise you, your users, they are going to surprise you with amazing ways that you never knew you could do. They're going to put them together and surprise you with their innovation and ingenuity. So always when planning, a, particularly when planning a SaaS-based product, plan it so that they are interlinkable in multiple ways, in multiple meaningful ways. Don't ask the idiotic question of, hey, why would anybody, anybody want to jack this into that? You'll be surprised, you're wrong. So build everything with proper interfaces, proper shake hand mechanisms, proper trust and data sharing, but ensure that they are interlocking blocks with infinite possibilities, not end of life solutions which have only one thing that they do okay. So extensibility, plan for extensibility. I talked about uh, the threats of going global. These days with GDPR and so many other laws coming in, so many billion dollar fines being talked about in mainstream media, you need to be very careful. You need to actually understand the law of the land. Did you know if you ran a service, software as a service, and a Russian user came to your site, and you collected data about that Russian user, you allowed to retain a copy of that Russian user's data inside Russia? Did you know? That's according to Russian law. You have to be careful, because that's an anti-terrorism effort, spy ring effort. So you need to have a nice little corner in your company where these kind of legalities are worked out. It's not just a dot com and you're live. That's a recipe for disaster. Think open. Whenever you build your technology stack, whenever you try to create new architectures, always embrace open standards. Many reasons. There are many reasons for it. First of all, open standards keep improving. They don't get tied into a particular company because take a look at what's happening to Java today. Java is now being choked to death, choked to a slow death by Oracle. So you need to have your faith and trust placed on the real, meaningful, open standards. Another reason for trusting open standards is when you talk about security, security is not obscurity. I won't tell my password to anybody, so I am safe. That's not good enough anymore. Because somebody someday is going to steal your password. Even if my password is stolen, I will get an alert on my mobile phone and only then you can get into my service. That is security. So security, not by obscurity. Security is not saying, I won't tell you what algorithm I am using to encrypt my data. Security is saying, this is the algorithm I'm using to encrypt my data, try cracking it. It's a million dollar problem. It's uncracked for 50 years today. That is what, that is industry military standard encryption I'm using. So there is a difference between security by obscurity 
and security through open standards. I saw this in the bag today. Play well together. Because when you get into SaaS, it's not just a monolithic product or a suite of products that are from one company. You always have to have proper openings, proper plugs, proper welcoming kits with which you can actually embrace other companies who also have your customer's data. Just because you have a product and it takes care of the whole uh, workflow in a marketing campaign, for example, don't say, I will not connect with a chat bot. Because the chat bot SaaS might have put in so much effort on its artificial intelligent algorithm, if you play well with that, it's a win-win-win for you, for the other company, and for the customer. So always do not lock your doors. Have proper facilities for your service to import and export and integrate deeply into other SaaS services. And finally, this is my favorite actually. Marshall McLuhan is the person who said this, I think. He said, we think we use tools. We think we use tools and we get work done. But over time, the tools that we use shape the way we think. So if you are a company building SaaS products, look inside. What's the chef's lunch? What's the chef eating? What tools are you consuming? Are those products meaningfully talking to each other? Are they improving your productivity? Tools from improve your productivity. So you need to pick the right kind of tools. That's a very important aspect. Because a company like Slack, where the CEO walks in in shorts, can adapt and adopt a universal casual language. And we will all embrace it. Because it speaks the CEO's culture. It speaks the culture of the person running it. So if you want your product to actually reflect who you are, you need tools that are democratizing creativity. That's a very important aspect. So I told you till now about pitfalls to avoid while developing a, a SaaS product. So the pitfalls are gone. Yeah. But I didn't tell you which road to take. That's up to you to decide. right? Just because there are no pitfalls in a road doesn't mean the road leads to the right destination. It's for you to think about, obsess, collaborate with your other founders, and identify. All the best. Am I up for time? I have a few more slides. Somebody? Who to work with? Seven slides. How do you pick a good team, if you want? Yeah? There's no organizer here. OK, how do you pick the right kind of team? I had a collection of slides, so I'll just quickly run through them. The first thing is ignore paper qualifications. Right? There are no colleges today that actually create and nurture the right kind of talent that can be brought into a high-tech software company and can be asked to be productive from day one. Look at the rebels in the last bench looking for a cause. Those are the kids you need to actually intake, take into your company, not paper qualifications. Hire better than yourself. This is a lesson right from Apple's Steve Jobs day. Do not try to retain your position of strength by hiring people who will be B players. Because if a A player like you recruits B players, the B players will usually recruit C players, and it gets worse. So always hire better than yourself. Don't hire an editor or a content writer or a programmer who does an OK job, but you put up with it because you will do a great job, but you don't have the time for it, so you assign it to somebody else. That's the wrong way to do it. Hire a person who will do a greater job faster than you, and you'll be happy to move away from the interface. That's the kind of people you have to hire. And when hiring, give them the mall test. This is from Guy Kawasaki, ex-Apple, 
great venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, he says if you're stuck in a dilemma about whether to recruit this person or not for your startup team, everything looks fine. The credentials, the experience, everything is perfect. But somehow there is something that's blocking you. He says give it a day's rest. And if you happen to meet them in the mall, you're window shopping, there's a big glass wall here, and in the reflection you see this guy or woman come up on the escalator. Think for yourself. Do you turn around, extend your hand, and try to look at the conversation? Or do you slink away, afraid, not knowing what to do with this person in an informal setting? That's the answer you're looking for, he says. Because most startups, it's not a work-life balance with a clear-cut division. You will work on Saturday nights. You will probably go to a movie on Thursday afternoon. So you need to actually co-opt them into your family. That's very important. In this movie, World War Z, he talks about the concept of a tenth man. He wants to know why only Israel, only that city, survived the oncoming zombie apocalypse. Brad Pitt. And that other guy says, the whole world got the early warning that there was some zombie apocalypse coming because of a leaked virus. Nobody listened to that warning. Nobody listened to that danger. So Brad Pitt asks, how did you listen to it? Isn't it foolish? Isn't it silly when you hear it? that there is a zombie apocalypse coming. And that's when this minister says, in our city, our mayor has implemented a concept called the 10th man. There are nine people in the boardroom. There are nine people in the boardroom. And there is a 10th man who has been appointed, whose only job is to say stop when all the nine are unanimous towards something. If the, all the other nine in the room are unanimously saying they should do something or they should not do something, it is this guy's job to say, stop. Show me some variation. Show me the spectrum. And that's when they realize probably the zombie apocalypse is real, and that's when they built a 90-feet wall which saved the city. So when you recruit people, it's going to be hard working with people like the 10th man. It's not, they will not conform their opinion of hard work might be very different from yours. But you need people like that to go beyond the envelope, to bring disruptions into the game, to do small things that have disproportionate impact, make a dent in the universe. Don't look for MBAs, because those are the guys who are trained about this. Possible upside might be little, but downside is high, brand will get damaged, I will not risk it, my profit and loss statement will be uh, going for a six, I won't do that. Versus look at that guy who is ready to take risks because he's got nothing to lose, not even a reputation. He will keep attempting experiments, taking risks. Those are the kind of people you need for startups. No college teaches that. Don't look at hierarchies like this or this. Don't look at complete flat organizations like this either. This is a good structure to have. They call it the team of teams. In fact, there is a guy, Colin McChrystal, who has written a book called The Team of Teams. He is a, an army general from the Iraq war, and he talks about the importance of having information shared within teams, but not outside teams. So I'm really finishing it now. Thanks a lot. One more time, ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Mr. Rajendra for joining us out here this afternoon and spreading his wisdom and his insights. Thank you, sir, for being with us at our brand new demo day 2018.